Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nelson Morris. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about extending Line again. Um, it's kind of become the standard build tool here in the Clojure world. And if, you've, if you were at the Conj or if you saw some of the videos, there was a talk by a guy named Tim Ewald who did uh, hand program or hand uh, woodworking with hand tools. Uh, and towards the end of it, he makes an analogy. Uh, he doesn't quite make it all the way, so I'll do it for him, that says that line is like a power tool. It's this very um, complex and possibly sharp thing with some edges you can you cut yourself, and he does a bunch of stuff for you. Um, and I'll say this is pretty much true, but it's a bit more like a whole bunch of power tools put together into an assembly line, because you do have um, the dependency management piece that goes out on the internet. And if you tell it you want something like Apache Commons, then it pulls down all the miscellaneous things that come with that. Um, it does, uh, project, uh, does um, profile merging. And this allows you to have like a dev profile and a test profile. Um, and this came up recently in IRC where someone had, a, uh, had some resources they wanted just for their tests. But these are multi-gigabyte resources. And then when they actually put a jar together and tried to publish it, it was a multi-gigabyte jar, which uh, was not what they were looking for. So, um, and then Lining It does a bunch of other things, such as uh, okay, project isolation, uh, task resolution. Whenever you run it from the command line, it goes and figures out what the actual task that you want to run is. It does um, project isolation, so that what's in the Lining It virtual machine tries not to affect what's actually in your uh, project, and so you don't get, when you're in your project, you don't get line again dependencies somehow coming in and messing things up. Uh, it also does, uh, lately, uh, new project generation, so templating for creating new projects out very quickly. Um, now from this, we've tried to create a data interface towards, the, towards line again, and this is the project map. Pretty much every closure project has one now, since it, lots of them use Linegan. Um, you can set your dependencies, and you can set a bunch of other miscellaneous things in it. And so I'm here to talk to you about what you can do beyond just what's right there in the project map, but things that, we have, that are uh, other ways to extend the Linegan uh, pieces. And I'm going to start with, or let's see. Uh, so for this, I'm going to talk about uh, how to define new tasks, how to actually change Linegan's behavior that you want to uh, at runtime, um, and uh, how you do the, the template generation. Uh, so you can define your own. After you've defined all these, these changes to Linegan that you want to make, whenever you go start a new project, you have these templates that already have everything built up for you. To start with, we'll talk about new tasks. Um, and to talk about new tasks, we have to talk briefly about a little bit of the internals of Linegan. About Line. Um, I mentioned it briefly when I talked about the isolation mechanism. But when Linegan starts up, it's going to start a Linegan virtual machine, represented here by the much more complex picture. Um, this is the part where it goes out and does the profile merging, the dependency resolution, the task resolution, all that good stuff. And then whenever you're fi it's finally ready, what it will do is it will spin up a another Java virtual machine, passing just the class path entities, just the jars that you need for your class paths and setting that up every much smaller. And so you have to think about, where do I want my task to run at? If I'm going to create a new task, is it a project level task? Do I want it to run at the project level? Is it something that actually wants to change how Linegan itself works? Then I have to do something at the Linegan level. Um, and in general, uh, the, the law, you'll hear lots of stuff about Linegan plugins. And if you're going to do a project level task, you don't need to worry about things at, about plugins, about the, the deeper uh, uh, ways you can change it. But if you want to operate outside your project and affect Linegan itself, then you do have to create a Linegan plugin. Uh, so. How do you create the project tasks? And this is, we have, we've got uh, Phil, who is the creator and maintainer of Linegan, has a general theory that a lot of tasks that people think, hey, I need to have a plugin, can just be these project level tasks. Um, 
And these are much more simpler to create. Uh, you can use it doing something called aliases. Um, I'm going to talk, show an example here. Uh, this is the database migration code, roughly summarized uh, database migration code for Clojars. Uh, in it, we define a namespace in our project, uh, clojars.db.migrate, and then we define a main function, which then calls out to our migration stuff, and actually we pass the, uh, the, name, the vars rep you know, representing the uh, functions that it then needs to run. And now to actually call this from a command line structure, what we want to do is we want to put this alias into the project map. We tell it that the aliases are, are a map from the, the key is going to be the task name, and the value is going to be what it basically expands out to. So here we have, when I run migrate, what I actually want you to do instead is go do this line run command. Dash M means, and use the main from this next name, from the namespace. So run with the main from clojars.db.migrate. Uh, and this allows me just to say line migrate, the task resolution happens, finds out that it's an alias, and then can run at the project level doing the project stuff that I want it to do. These are particularly useful for, um, like I mentioned, project level stuff. So if you have, uh, if you're doing DB, or if you have a database and you don't want to create a GUI for, say, deleting some of your data or moving itself, you might have, have more of a command line interface. You can just run a task, for, run an alias for this. If you have uh, a messaging queue and you need to insert some messages on initialization or startup, you can do it here. Um, this is also particularly useful for cron tasks. Uh, if you've got cron and you decide to use line as part of your deployment platform, uh, it can just call into these particular aliases. And it's much simpler than trying to create anything else. Uh, we also use something similar for our enclosures for our stats for the download stats. Every 24 hours, it'll go through the logs and say what has been downloaded and push this out into a file. Then thing gets loaded by uh, the Clojars web system and picks it up. And this is all done uh, through a very similar alias mechanism. Um, an advantage of aliases, being that they're project level stuff and they stay at the project, is that this uh, main function I have here can actually, if, if you don't want to use line as part of your deployment, as part of your deployment runtime and your production runtime, you can just deploy a jar. And then when you get ready to run like a cron task, you can just do Java, jar, or put the jar on the class path and uh, tell it to run this particular main function from, from stuff using the normal closure evaluation stuff, evaluation. Um, so it provides both a way to do it from a jar deployment, and then you can use aliases to make it much nicer from a line again deployment. Now, if you want to actually affect uh, the line again structure, the line again, um, uh, what it does, then you, to, for your task, then we got to talk a little about, about what line again does for its task resolution. And so this is a summarized version of uh, the main that you call into whenever you start up, when you run line. It eventually ends up here, uh, does this concept called profile merging, where it tries to figure out which profile you're in and loads all the relevant. Um, I'll talk about them later, but hooks and middleware pieces. And then it calls into this function called resolve and apply. Uh, that eventually ends up at a function called apply task, which does the alias handling mechanism I talked about a minute ago. And then it will call resolve task to figure out what the actual, if, it, if it's not an alias, it'll end up doing resolve task to figure out, um, to load up the namespace and, and get, it, get it going. And it calls into the function for your task using the project and then the command line arguments. Uh, eventually, the, the resolve task function ends up here, where it looks up the actual task var. Uh, and it does this by line again dot template name, or task name dot, or slash task name. Um, so when you create a plugin, it's going to be line again dot plugin name. And to define a new task, you define the uh, plugin name for that task. Or using the same the, the task with the same function with the same name. Um, here's a very very simple one, uh, zzz, and it creates a task called zzz, which basically completely ignores the project and calls into some other function somewhere.
And now, at the, at the lining in level, there's a lot of times that you want to maybe manipulate lining it just a little bit and then actually continue running a task at the project level. And the way that you do this is with a, a function called eval in project. This comes from lineagain.core.eval slash eval in project. Um, the, first the first argument is going to be the project that you're wanting to run. The second one is going to be the code that you want to run once the, that JVM has started and it's ready, ready to go. And the third argument is actually some code that you want to run a step before you run the, or the code from the second argument. Um, this involves uh, working around something called that Phil has named the Gallardi scenario. Um, it basically has to do with the way that closure reads the arguments. If you tried to do a require in as part of the, the second argument, it looks at it and says, I don't know what ZZZ is. Even though you're about to require it, I don't know. I'm going to blow up. So there's this, this pre-initialization step that can happen. And so for a lot of things that want to, to call back into the project, they want to call back into a specific point. A good example of this is line ring. Uh, in your project map, you'll define a handler, uh, which is going to be the web, the web piece that actually it goes and starts up. Uh, you define this in the, in the project map under the ring key. And then what ring actually does for the, uh, the code that it wants to evaluate after, as part of the eval and project is it uh, calls into this, the, the result of this function here, uh, which is the server, ring server lining in serve function. And it's going to pass in the configuration map that you put under the ring key. So it's going to take the symbol represented by the hello world.core handler. It's going to take that. It'll pass it off into the project VM. And that is then read in the project VM and is able to be used as the starting function, sort of like a, almost a callback type mechanism, but that direction. Uh, there are others, other uh, ways that you can do this. I believe one of the early versions of like the line and mutant plugin, they had a namespace that if it was, uh, if you had an, a mutant namespace, then an init initializer, it could say, OK, well, we, we know that this exists, so we're going to go run the initialization stuff from there. If you have a, if you have a plugin that wants to run uh, and doesn't care about whether it has a project or not, then you have to put a little bit of metadata at the front here uh, for this no project needed. Uh, this lets us know that uh, it's OK for it to run without a project. Uh, this is a, some examples are line, the ones that are built in are like line REPL, line HELP, line NEW. All those ones are things that run outside of the project. They don't care about having a project. Uh, I've also seen plugins. I saw one when I scanned in the, the, the list of a line ping, which almost certainly doesn't need to have a project in order to go out and ping a web server. Uh, as, part of pro as part of plugins, uh, when you're doing stuff, you might hit a point where you need to abort. You might say, oh, I don't actually have the, the right configuration. Or maybe you called out to a web server, and the web server didn't respond. Um, and Line again provides a couple of functions for this. Exit takes a, an, error, uh, an exit code and a message, and abort just takes a message. But you want to use these over trying to shut down the JVM yourself. Because there are what are called higher level tasks, like line do which allow you to say, do this, then do this, then do this, all within the same line again virtual machine. So if you yourself have create a plugin that's then going to shut down the virtual machine, well, then all the rest of the people in that chain have now have no ability to actually run. So we provide uh, these methods here. Uh, and they get, if you're the only task, it will do the proper exit thing. If you're not, then we do a little bit of uh, uh, magic to let it keep going. All right, so I showed about creating tasks and how to call back into the project test. But we didn't really change much about Linegan's behavior yet. Um, in order to do that, the easiest way is if you can just change the project map. I want to call out a pretension to a couple of keys here. Um, oh, well, actually here. Um, an example of doing this in the way that was generally recommended through, lining, through the Linegan team now, is to check, is, is 
in the ZZZ, so that's our task, um, the first thing we do is we check and say, do we, uh, did the user define a ZZZ profile? If so, then we want to use what's there. Otherwise, we want to use this default one that's, that we defined earlier in our, in our namespace. We then want to call merge profiles on our project and that particular profile. This gives Line a chance to do all the stuff that it needs to do for its, for its changing of profiles. And then we'll call, pass that off in eval and project. And so what this does here is, assuming there is no, the user doesn't have a ZZZ profile, it adds this new dependency into the tree, into the, the dependency tree that we want. And when we call eval and project, that, that dependency ends up on the class path. You see this a lot. In fact, this is probably one of the most common things about uh, to do for a plugin, is you have uh, line ring does it in order to bring in the ring dependencies. Uh, line CLJS build uses it to bring in the closure script dependencies. Uh, pretty much anything where you're going to call into another project with a plugin. Let me phrase this. Anywhere, anytime that you're going to call at the project level on a dependency that may not be already required, you should have a, a profile that adds that dependency into it so you don't blow up at runtime. All right, so there's a couple key, other keys I want to mention in particular. Um, one of them is called prep tasks. There, I haven't seen this one used as much as it could be. Uh, when you have prep tasks, these are tasks that need to be run before we get to the, to the evaluation point, the part where the project's ready to go. Uh, it's going to be a list of all of the, all the tasks. And this kind of creates this, this life cycle type mechanism if you're more familiar with Maven. It's not quite that direct, not quite that far, but more headed that direction. Um, and this uses the general same task resolution mechanism I talked about before. So if you have another plugin, like th there's a plugin called Line Shell, um, we could, if that was included here, we would call out shell and then we call make. There's a Line Protobuf plugin which provides a Protobuf command and that would call, you know, the, the next step would be to call compile. It would then compile the protobuffers, hit Java, do the Java compilation that it needs to, and then do the, if you want to do the closure compilation, and then once all that's done, it's finally ready to run the rest of the stuff. The next key I want to talk about is a key called injections. And injections will run as one of the first things of starting up the project virtual machine. Uh, we get a lot of questions, or there's, there's an, not a lot, but it's a common question of how can I figure out what version my code is at runtime? And we've got this separation between the line again virtual machine and the project virtual machine. And the line again virtual machine has the project mapped, but by the time you pass things all the way down to the, uh, uh, the project virtual machine, the project map doesn't pass along with it by, normally. And so here's a way, a way um, you can put this in a, in a task um, where you say, change the injections key. And as part of this, the first thing I want to do is look at the project, turn it into a string, and spit it out into a resource. And then on the project side, you're able to then read that resource, turn it, turn it back into a real map, and say, oh, I, have, I now have a version that tells me what version of the code I'm running. So those are the two. Those are two of the bigger keys that aren't used as often. That represent a lot of. That represent some abilities to change uh, uh, line again. But if you find yourself not able to do what you want through the project map, the big hammer and way to change line again's behavior are called hooks. Uh, in your plugin namespace, if you have a function called hooks, it'll get run uh, as part of the profile merging. If you have a function called activate, then it's up to the user to say, yes, I, hooks are true. Go and actually run this code. Uh, as an example of the first one, uh, I created a, a plugin called line pedantic at one point that hooked into the dependency resolution and would look and say, do I have, am I pulling down an older version of a dependency than something once? And if I am, then I probably want to go figure this out first before I, before I actually try and get into my code and figure out that I have some problem at runtime. So just abort the whole thing. And by just including the plugin, since this is all it did, by including the plugin, it was sort of implicit that this is the behavior that you wanted. So I defined it in the hooks function. Uh, an example of the activate, using the activate function is closure uh, CLJS build. 
CLJS build has some hooks that you can add, or has hooks that when you run line compile, it will also do the CLJS compiler. When you run line test, it will actually run some closure script tests. If you run line clean, it will actually do, uh, do the, the CLJS clean. Uh, now the way that hooks are generally used is, or are defined, is that you use a library called robert.hook. And this is already included in the project, or in the um, uh, dependency list, or already included as part of the line virtual machine, so when you require it, it comes in. Um, this bottom line here, I could have done this a little bit differently, but the bottom line uh, it calls hook, which is the Robert hook uh, namespace, and it says add a hook. And in this case, it's saying hook onto the line again compile task and replace it with this compile hook that I have defined above. The compile hook, or when you use Robert hook, it takes the first argument that gets passed to your, your new function that you defined is the old task, the old function that would have ran, and then you get all the arguments that would have went to it. So in the case of something like uh, CLJS build, and it hooks into the compile task, it still wants the closure compiler to run. So the very first thing it does, it says, okay, we'll go run the first, you know, apply task args, go run the first, the, the original task that was there, and then now we're gonna run our, our closure script compiler. And you can hook into, um, you don't just have to hook task level things in line again. Uh, for example, in the pedantic plugin I mentioned before, I actually hooked into the dependency resolution uh, portion of it. Um, if you go through, uh, unfortunately, hooks do require knowing a little bit about lining in itself. You've got to kind of figure out what is the right function I want to replace. And if you go look at the code, uh, lining in has a convention that if it's marked with internal metadata, so if it has colon internal on the front of it, uh, then, it's a pub then it's a private function that can change. If it doesn't have that, it's considered part of the public API, and you are welcome to go redefine it or use hooks on it as you want to. We'll try and keep it as stable as we can. Um, now, we don't use the normal private and public mechanism because when you're using vars, as we're doing here in the ad hook, um, vars can go and jump into private, func or private functions anyways. Uh, they completely ignore the private metadata, and so if you refer to them this way, you still get the function back out. So it's not like there's a, a compiler error anywhere in here that, would, that, would, that we're avoiding. All right. So I've talked about tasks, about defining new tasks. I've talked about how to change the project map and how to extend line again with hooks. Um, there's another concept called middleware. And it's similar to ring middleware, and that's given a similar name. Um, but this is something that's going to run all the time uh, for any task. So changing the project level, or project, changing, project tests, ugh, changing the project map just at the task level means it only affects for when you run that specific task. But if you're going to do it at the, at the middleware level, it'll affect every task. Um, and so an example of doing that would be the, the saving of the project map that I showed earlier with the injections key. So here I do the same uh, check and see if the user already defined this particular profile. If not, then use this, def this default one I've defined. And then merge it in, and then I'm going to return it. So middleware. Sorry, middleware, you uh, define a function in your, pl in your plugin namespace called middleware, and it takes a project map and it needs to return the project map. And it can then manipulate the project map as it wants to. Uh, so yeah, in this one I change the, the resource, the, I include the injections key if I can. And this is useful for, uh, like I said, running for any task. So before, when I was doing it at just the task level, maybe I just do it at compile. But Really, for something like this, you might want it to run anytime line REPL runs, or anytime uh, line run runs, or anytime line compile, line, uh, yeah. You want to do it for a whole bunch of tasks, maybe the tests in particular, also as, a, as an example. Mm. Okay, I don't see middleware used quite that often. Most, most plugins do more task level manipulation. Uh, but it is here for whenever you, if you need something to generally just change part of that behavior. All right. And so now the last thing that I particularly want to talk about for lining in are its template mechanism. 
uh, once you finally have defined all these plugins or the middleware and stuff that you want, whenever you go to create a new project, you might actually not want to have to rewrite your project file to include all that stuff all the time. Uh, so we have a template mechanism. Uh, to define a template, it's linegin.new.template name as your namespace. Uh, you define a function also by template name. It takes the name of the project, and then params here is going to be the command line arguments that come along. So you, when you run line new foo uh, project name or um, project name or directory, and then you can pass a whole bunch of other command line arguments to it. Uh, by convention, uh, lining in template or the, the actual template files that you're going to copy over uh, go into the source directory just a level deeper than what your, your namespace was. So you follow the same namespacing thing. Uh, namespace to directory plan. Oh, I meant to change that slide a little. Oh, well. Uh, so uh, here is a, a, an example of a template. Uh, what you would, in general, what you would do is you bring in uh, a, a namespace called linegin.new.templates. This is going to have a whole bunch of helper functions already defined for you. Um, and then in, in this case, uh, since the, name plate, then since the uh, template name is template here, uh, we define a function name template. Uh, in this case, it doesn't care about the command line arguments, so it just takes the project name. Uh, this renderer function, uh, you pass to it the directory that it's going to look for the template files, the, the ones that get, that get changed. And then it's going to return to you a function, which I've named render. By, by convention, it's going to be a render. And it's actually going to be what you use later to generate the new strings for your files that you'll use. Uh, and then you also generally create a, da a, a data type object, which is a map. It just maps a name over to the values that you want it to be as you pass that into your template. Uh, now, inside the let here, you, you usually use this arrow files. Uh, uh, function, and you pass it the data, which lets it go and understand which uh, which the directory structure is that it actually wants to go and write out everything to, and then you can pass it a set a list of um, well a var args list of uh, vectors. The first element is going to be the uh, temp the file name that comes out, and the second element is going to be the string that it's going to render. Uh, in this case, we use the render function that we got earlier. We tell it, render, this is the particular template, and then here's the data that contains all the substitutions that we want to make into it. Uh, if you look down there at the bottom, there is one that has this, sanitize, this double bracket sanitized as part of the file name. Uh, Linig the, per the Linigan uses, or this template mechanism uses uh, uh, mustache as it's templating things. So if you've, you've seen mustache, this is how they do it. Or if you haven't seen mustache, this is how they do it. Uh, and all that does is it replaces sanitized with the value that came out of data. When it, lo it lo takes the, the data map, it looks and says, here's the sanitized key, or give me the value of the sanitized key, and it replaces it in there. Um, on this previous line here, we see that it is sanitized of name, and name is the project name. Uh, and sanitize in this case does a lot of stuff to help handle uh, changes that, line, that, that closure needs in order to go from dashes to underscores or underscores to dashes for the project, uh, for namespaces to uh, the file system. Um, I think it also handles a couple of other things, but that's the big one is, is the underscores and the dashes. Uh, here's an example of, the, of a template file, a templated file. Uh, a project file which just says, hey, we can pull out name from the data whenever you actually go to render me. And there are lots of other helpful functions in this template's um, namespace. In particular, some ones to draw attention to are here, uh, but multi-segment is a big one if you write your own templates because a lot of people like to deeply namespace their, temp their, their closure code, and some people don't. So if you have you know, org.closures.zeki.project, you know, project, then this multi this multi-segment and the sanitized namespace and all that help translate 
from this deeply dotted thing into the right files and into getting just the particular project name from that and so on. Now all of this is defined in uh, linegan.new.templates. Um, it's not that big of a file. Um, I don't. It's not too bad. It's very. It's pretty well uh, has a bunch of doc strings and other things into it. So if you go and write templates, I definitely recommend looking and seeing what do these functions do and can do you need to be using them when you're there. All right. So in summary. Uh, when you're ready, if you're trying to extend line again, for new tasks, what you want to do is either aliases, if you can. They're the easier way to do it and probably better if you can get away with just doing that one. Otherwise, you need to do a plugin. And we talked about plugin resolution and what it can do. Uh, if you want to change the behavior of line again at a task or a middleware level, um, modifying the project map is going to be the easiest way. If you can find there, if we have a key exposed that you can just change to do what you need to. Otherwise, you can use the hooks mechanism, which is a really big hammer, and you kind of have to understand a little bit more of the internal code level. If you find yourself using hooks on a lot of things that are not task level, then please come let us know. It might be a representation of some place that we need to expose a key in the project map for. OK, and then we talked about. Uh, templates and how they're used to generate new projects. Uh, if you have questions, we're, the IRC channel is pretty uh, well staffed at different times. Um, and we usually, and Phil is very, very good about answering questions whenever he's around. Or you can go to linegan.org, which contains information on how to join and send stuff to the Linegan mailing list. Or you can send it to the closure mailing list because we all follow that, anyways. Um, and there's some information on me. Uh, in general, it seems that I am the uh, Linegan person here for, for Closure West this year. So if you have any questions about Linegan, please feel free to come up and talk to me at any point in time. Thank you. <laughs>